please welcome back Director Mark Levin. Thank you. Let me just give you a, a quick, very quick, before I take any questions, a uh, little brief history of how this film happened. Uh, in 1986, during the Iran-Contra hearings, I was a young producer for Bill Moyers at the hearings when Ali North testified. Uh, and that was the first time I ever heard uh, somebody chanting, CIA, crack in America. That was kind of the beginning of hearing of this story. And I was lucky enough to be a producer on the Emmy Award winning a Moyer show, The Secret Government, about the Iran-Contra uh, scandal in the 80s. 10 years later, I did a documentary series for Discovery called CIA America's Secret Warriors uh, about the history of the CIA. We were the first crew ever allowed on the seventh floor of the Directorate of Operations in Langley, which is Spook headquarters. Um, and it was during that production that I first met Gary Webb, who you saw tonight in actually an interview that no one has seen. This is the last interview that was ever done with him 10 days before he died, courtesy of Quincy Jones Jr. Um, we started, uh, he came over to our, our shop here on 26th Street, and he was the one who first started telling me about Freeway Rick Ross. I started uh, writing Rick and we started communicating by uh, phone and 10 years after that, uh, well Rick and I really hit it off because as you saw in the film, Rick was a tennis player and I happen to have a passion for tennis also. And of course Rick said, oh well you're some old middle-aged guy, I'm gonna whip your ass, you come out to Texarkana, we got one tennis court and I'm the champ. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna make it out there. I finally did make it out there in 2006. Of course, the Bush administration had closed down the tennis court because it was an unneeded luxury for prisoners. Uh, but he and I spent a full day together, and I was amazed by his optimism. I had been sending him books uh, about business. Uh, he was a voracious reader by then, and he told me about his challenge, his legal challenge, and that he was confident that he was gonna get out and we were gonna make a film together. I knew enough about the federal judicial system to know that beating a federal life without parole sentence is, you know, a one in a thousand chance. That is pretty rare. But three years later, I got a call uh, from Rick, and he said, I'm on a bus ride home. You actually saw part of it in this film. I told you I was going to get out. You better get your ass to L.A. We're going to make that movie. So that's how this started. Uh, and now I'd like to open it up uh, for any comments or questions. That was part of the mission, was to find <laughs> Danilo Blandone. Uh, when I went down to Nicaragua with uh, a guy, there was no way I would have ever gotten to Blandone, although I did speak to him as you saw in the film and he invited me down. He was rather gracious on the phone, but of course by the time I got there he was much more evasive. Um, I was with a guy, Alex, who knew his way around Nicaragua. He was a Nicaraguan American, and his father, it turned out, I wasn't aware of this, was the coach of the Nicaraguan baseball team who in 1972 beat Cuba. That was a high point in Nicaraguan history. <laughs> and there were stadiums named after this gentleman and statues of him. So I had the rare guide who was able to talk to both ex-Sandinistas and ex-Contras, could move freely through the country and really knew his way around. So we tracked Blandone down. Blandone, you know, would say, oh, meet me here, and he would never be there, meet me here. We finally ended up at the lumber yard in an industrial section of Managua, and we just sat in the car. At first, his people said he isn't here. Three or four hours later, they finally invited us in uh, to um, a small room where this rather dapper man was sitting and his first words to me were, Gary Webb tried to find me, Congresswoman Maxine Waters tried to find me, Oliver Stone tried to find me, you found me. Uh, he was rather nervous, as you can imagine, because he wasn't sure exactly what my mission was. I mean, I told him we were doing a documentary, but whether he believed that or not, he did send Rick Ross uh, to prison for life, set him up, testified, as you saw. 
Uh, so I think there was a paranoia that maybe we were a hit squad or, you know, there for vengeance. But luckily I had Alex with me, who not only spoke Spanish, but because of his father and because of who he was, was able to really loosen the situation up. So what I learned from Landone, although he refused to go on camera, as you see, and even let me take a still of him, what I learned were a few things. The first was, he told me, I said, you betrayed Rick, you set him up. He said, no, Rick betrayed me first. So I was like, okay, well, what do you mean? Well, that's for in the future, Mark. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. I can't really discuss that now. Okay. Yeah. Second was as he warmed up, you began to see there was a genuine affection there, uh, despite what he told me in this phone call. And one of the things that he said about Rick was that the Nicaraguans really appreciated that he was able to contain violence, that he was able to work with both Bloods and Crips and not uh, see it turn into bloodshed. That was something they truly valued. Um, another thing he said at one point, I would say the greatest admission he made in my 45 minutes with him was when I asked him about the 1986 bust, which is obviously a key plot point in the film. I said, were you tipped off? Did the Fed, somebody tell you what was going on? And he just stared at me and eventually he smiled. And I took that to be basically a yes, that he conceded, yes, I was tipped off. I was in touch with insiders, uh, as the policeman here suggested, Roberto Juarez. Uh, the final thing he, he, he said was, we were just a pebble, a little stone uh, in this big boulder. We didn't start the, the crack epidemic. We were just this little pebble. Now, that may well be true. I mean, obviously there were lots of different sources for cocaine. Uh, it's just that this one narrative so connects, it's almost like a zealot or the Forrest Gump of the drug war. There's so many elements of what has happened in the crack era over the last 30 years that Rick's life converged with. Um, so basically, as we, we left, he said, Mark, Someday, I'm going to tell my story. It's not going to be in Rick's movie. It's going to be in my movie. And I want you to come back and do that. <laughs> but I think, for me at least, part of the, the passion of wanting to do it is because here we sit at maybe a tipping point in terms of our whole attitude, both politically and culturally, to the war on drugs and to our criminal justice system. Not only the criminal justice and drug reform, but the literacy element of this is something that is tremendously powerful. And Rick is really able to reach audiences that many, many educators really can't reach. So that is one of our dreams, working with Al Jazeera America and working with some of the other people. And if any of you have suggestions, you know, that is something very much on our minds, is how do we get this out after the broadcast to really take it on a tour so that you can have conversations, it can be part of even the, the movement that's happening now, the Black Lives Matter movement that is that has happened. Uh, in the last year. It's critical that as that movement goes forward, there's a knowledge and awareness of how we ended up in the lunacy that we're facing now. The militarization of the police and the corruption of the police, you saw it right on screen. Roberto Juarez, that is the first time he has ever spoken about his own guilt as a policeman who became corrupt. Uh, so. The, the, the militarization and spread of gangs, you know, and, and the gang culture and the gangster culture. All of this is mixed in to how do we address going forward. Freeway was obviously his nickname. Crack in the system, for me, not only is it about crack, but it's the crack in the system. It's the looking behind the, the curtain like in The Wizard of Oz. It's that glimpse into how does it really work. And there's something about this narrative, for me at least, that, that drew me in as a way of seeing how our system works. You very rarely get that glance, that, that, that glimpse of the naked mechanics 
of how it all comes together and fits together. So originally it was simply crack in the system, but then we wanted to add Rick's nickname, and also there is something beyond the movement with Freeway, the Freeway, finding the Freeway, finding yourself to freedom. If you want to reduce the film to its simplest uh, one-liner, in the beginning you have a man who is sentenced to life in prison, you hear him saying he's dreaming of getting out, in the end he gets out. How did he find the Freeway? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much.